you guys are hearing it first on Hammer Factor. He sent me an email. He apologized. He said he's going to be running a life jacket from here on out. So, man, Corey, we're good. Thank you for listening. You're listening to Grace, Geltman, and Weld on the Hammer Factor. Take it away, boys. Okay, welcome to Hammer Factor. My name is John Grace, and I am here to put this show together, and I want to introduce my co-host here, outspoken co-owner of Immersion Research, Whitewater Legend, and consummate runner-up to Jeff Calhoun in the attainment race. Whoa, John, hold on. John <laughs> Weld. <laughs> Hang on just a second. I'd also like to introduce policy director for the Outdoor Alliance, North Fork champion, and the Nancy Pelosi of the Hammer Factor, Lewis Geltman. Thank you. We got a great show lined up. We got Pat Keller coming on to talk about uh, wearing your life jacket, which seems seems to be a hot hot topic. The the Instagram world is a fire. Did you see that that, that Brent Orton put together like a it, literally a fifteen minute long YouTube video of just him calmly talking into the camera about the importance of your wearing your life jacket? I did not see no. that. <laughs> but that's brilliant. I, I watched like I watched like five minutes of it. It was it was great. And then I was like, I can't watch a fifteen minute life jacket PSA any longer. But he, he articulated some really nice points. <laughs> it was very well done. He could probably get a Coast Guard grant or something for that. <laughs> we also have Ashley Knee. Um, female Olympian in the K-1 class uh, coming on the show to discuss a, uh, an article we ran across here uh, about the U.S. United States Olympic Committee, which uh, is going to be very interesting. Of course, we got viewer mail and rants and raves and all the fun stuff, but first, we're going to throw it over to Lewis Geltman. Everything is fucked. Am I supposed to have something? Do you have something you want to talk about? Hmm. Wait a second. (laughs) (laughs) Is this in the show notes? Well, (laughs) Well, thank you, Lewis. Well, there we go. Like I, I I definitely had one of my best intros ever, and uh, that was really good. (laughs) Seemed like we were rolling along here, and uh, and all of a sudden, so. What's going on in policy world, Lewis? There has to be something going on out there. You were uh, there were some discussions about uh, on uh, Pink Bike about some various topics and some other things. What would you like to touch on? Yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like I'm still just kind of in in the planning stage for for the year right now. Coming back from our big round of meetings in DC last week, but we are. Uh, He's just working out well. <laughs> I just picture you at Hooters with the gang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, Singleton with like a big shit eating grin on his face. <laughs> Getting like another order of wings. <laughs> Is that how it works up there? Uh, I think you gotta you gotta, gotta drive pretty far out of downtown DC to find any hooters around. But um, I don't know. You want to talk about that? Uh, that there's like a bunch of stuff kind of kicking around about folks trying to boycott uh, the Vista Outdoor brands as a result of all the shootings down or not all the shootings, but that recent most recent shooting I guess down in Florida. Vista is one of these big conglomerates that owns a bunch of outdoor industry brands, including. Um, Giro bike helmets and um, Camelback. I saw that there was a big push. It sounds like MEC up in Canada is going to drop those brands. But that Vista, the parent company, is like a huge assault weapons manufacturer and huge funder of the NRA. So there's like a lot of, I don't know, chatter about that or whether it's right to sort of take it out on these these other brands or whatever. I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting. You guys have thoughts on that? Uh, I haven't seen the discussion, but what, give us a little more info. Like, what are you seeing? What, like more specifics are people? Uh, people are just like, Oh, you know, like, like why are you taking it out on, you know, the, the people who developed the camel back and, you know, all these employees whose daily work has nothing to do with, uh, with guns because right. the parent company does, you know, that's a, that's a good point. I, I, I have to, this idea of, of 
protesting, uh, which is what is essentially a legal issue by boycotting a brand, by making a consumer, you know, bleeding over consumer. It seems to be like a relatively, I mean, the past 10 years, new thing, you know, like that's like, almost, I don't want to call it like a millennial form of protest, but it's, it's a modern form of protest to be, I think for sure. It strikes you know? me that a lot of it is, it's sort of like conservatives have almost won on this issue in a way in that, you know, they said, okay, we're not going to do anything about climate change. We're going to let the market handle this. And then when people start saying, okay, we're not going to purchase products anymore that, uh, you know, come from companies that are, are lobbying against taking climate action or are, you know, pushing for, uh, you know, free for all on, on guns, then the comeback is like, oh, you guys are just like politicizing, you know, these businesses or whatever. But I mean, it's sort of like, that's just one of the the levers of power that's left, you know? I mean, it's like, to me, it's like not very satisfying, but I don't know, like personally, when I think about those kind of buying decisions, it's like, you know, like we all drive cars, like we all, you know, burn gas. And I don't really have a problem with like the people or the companies that are, that are, you know, getting oil out of the ground. Like that's something we all need right now. But like when I do have a problem is when they start inserting themselves into our political conversation about our, the necessity of moving beyond that. Right. It's like, like right now we need their services, but we have to plan for a future where we don't. And when they're sort of inserting disinformation into that conversation and influencing our ability to like make collective decisions about the future that's when i'm like this is something i don't want to support and that's sort of how i feel about you know like the vista stuff is if they were just a gun manufacturer and they were you know abiding by the law and that was that i would sort of maybe be more sympathetic to that but when they're using the money that they're making from those activities to fund activism to prevent us from you know enacting reasonable gun reform like that's not something I want to support. What about the uh, NRA or NR people like Enterprise no longer honoring NRA discounts? I mean, Karen, I had a really long discussion about this the other day. As a company owner, it's sometimes you see it from the company standpoint. It's a tough decision. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you're honoring those kind of, I mean, if you're giving those organizations a discount, it's like you're basically offering a perk and encouraging people to join those organizations and support their agenda. And it's like, if that's something that, I mean, you don't want to make, you make it so that, uh, you know, everything is too sensitive to be involved with, but like, I don't want to support the NRA's agenda, you know? And it's like, if I have the, uh, you know, all things being equal, if I can pick between my money going towards something that's going to put some portion of those dollars into the pocket of the NRA or not, like I'm going to go not. So, I mean, so say you're, say you run an enterprise, right? And everyone in, I'm making this up, but ever, let's say everybody in the car rental business knows that some noteworthy portion of your income or customer base comes from these loyalty programs, right? And you have to have them. And so every car rental company has, you know, 20 or 30 people, groups that they offer discounts to, right? In the same way that like paddle, paddle sports companies offer pro deals to groups of people. And we do it because, well, we do it as a courtesy to our customers, but also I know that NRS is going to pro deal everybody they can as well. You know what I mean? And so we have to figure out how to play within those, those rules. So you come up with a policy, you say you're the car company, you come up with a policy of, of what basic requirements you need to be, to apply for these discounts, right? And all of a sudden the NRA has this, this, you know, there, this problem that, you know, that you just described enterprise has to come up with some policy change that will exclude them from this program. Like, like you should have shy of just calling, just outright calling them like a white supremacist group or just completely ethically wrong in every way, shape and form. You know what like I mean? It's that their policy is like, if you're a membership organization with 50,000 members, we offer you a 3000, you know, a 3% right. discount or whatever right. it is without right. regard to what it is. That's that right. Doing. Yeah, or it's a nonprofit or whatever, whatever 10 rules they have set up to become eligible for these discounts. What they said, though, is, and I, believe me, I am squarely in the, <laughs> you know, the legislate this gun rules 
camp in this argument. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's I mean they they've essentially said that this company no longer is eligible to even a, to be considered for those rules through some egregious moral shortcoming, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, I mean, I think that at some level that's necessary, right? I mean, it's like, it's kind of the same thing you see with, uh, you know, social media companies around like how their platforms are being used, where Facebook is like, ah, oh, you know, like we're just selling the ads or we're just, we're just a platform. We have no responsibility for the content or how it's disseminated. And meanwhile, you know, you can sell, uh, you know, like housing ads where you're targeting by, race and age and whatever else and it's like i don't know i mean at some level you you have a responsibility to to recognize how your your program is being used i guess right it's just a weird it's a, yeah i hear you it's a I weird mean, time it's, to be a company you know what i mean where companies are have a, an ethical presence you, you know what i mean it's just i don't know i don't know what to make of it i really don't i don't have I appreciate any, that perspective I don't have any answers for it, but I, I could appreciate it being difficult for them to have to make that decision for sure. And it's not as clear cut as people may think it may think it is. I definitely agree with that. It's not clear cut, you know, and like in the Vista uh, Vista thing that you were talking about, it's just kind of like a knee jerk response to something that is not there's not a knee jerk solution. This is a constitutional amendment we're talking about. You know, it's not one of those things that you can just like get emotional about. And then, you know, you got to really look for a solution. So it's a hard one to wade into for me. I mean, I see the company's viewpoint. It's just like offering a 10% discount to AW. If you go into your local retail or whatever, you know, it's like, yeah, AW has these memberships. Yeah. They're my, you know, it's, you can't, you but can't hate, the you can't hate I, on the company for... I think you can. I mean, I, I think if you're offering a, a discount to AW members, you're saying we as a company support AW's agenda. And I and so, you know, when you're buying from that company, you're, you know, on some level saying, you know, I mean, it's like you're getting a, a marketing windfall from that association. And, you know, there's costs and benefits to that. And if you're a company that wants to associate with the NRA, it's the same thing. It's like there's people who are going to support you because you're supporting the NRA. And there's other people who are going to, you know, not want to support you because you're so supporting every, So every company has to be politicized. Like they have to make that choice. Yeah, see, I agree with John on this one. I think that like they're forced to position where they have to look at the, at the, at the current social standing of every single organization they work with and decide where there's more customers. And they have to shift. Well, they decide. have to shift with the winds. So, like, if the winds not change, really, so. but I mean, it's. I think if you have principles as the individuals running a company, there's, you know, that should inform what you're doing and how you're doing business. It's like I think. Uh, I mean, or or you know, the other talk about people talk or, about things being politicized all the time, but it's like politicization of things. It's like it's become this like dirty word. Like you're like, oh, this is is just you're playing politics with like these kids who've died or whatever. It's like, you're not playing politics. You're, uh, you know, trying to make change in the world. It's like, I, I just feel like that. Uh, I mean, you know, or, politics I mean, is how we make decisions collectively. And it's like, you can vilify it or you can engage in it in a constructive way. The other, the other solution to this or the other way of looking at it is that the NRA, according to most people in this country has jumped from, uh, a, a an organization part of the ebb and flow of our, of our great legal system to, uh, essentially a hate group, you know, um, I think that's true. You know, marginalized, think- you know, and maybe that's the way most people feel in this country. And there's no discussion about that. It'd be like offering discounts to, you know, storm, whatever that, <laughs> what do those people call <laughs> Stormfront. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, think that's, I mean, I, that's kind of where I'm at, man. I mean, I, you know, 50 years ago, the NRA was like a, you know, did like gun safety classes and hunter education. And, uh, you know, it was like, they might've even been like the national governing body for shooting sports at one point. And they've transformed into like the lobbying arm of the gun industry that, you know, represents the most extreme proposals, you know, well beyond what the majority of gun owners support. And it's, it's not a, a, healthy presence yeah 
Certainly. Man, we're going we're gonna to really get some hate mail this week, I bet. That's all right. We get it every week. So real quick, though, before we move on from this, what was what were you seeing in the peak in the peak back discussions? What was going on there, like specifically? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, were people saying, don't buy those helmets? Or were they saying, it don't was much more, It was much more apolitical to pro-gun than I would have expected. <laughs> I, I think people were like, you know, I mean, there were some people who were like, I'm out, but most people, I think, were like, why are you telling us about this? This doesn't have anything to do with mountain biking or uh, I love guns and I'm going to buy stuff from Vista. And I was, I was a little disappointed, honestly. Anyway, good discussion. Lots of, lots to talk about in that regard, but can we move on to a little viewer mail? You guys ready for this? Let's. All right, I'm going to throw this one over to you, Mr. Weld. What happened hmm. to the vacation to hell? Well, I should throw this right back at you, Mr. Grace. <laughs> this, this, should, this comes at, <laughs> comes at us from Fernando uh, Palicios. So if Who you, is a, the, the, serial com, the serial writer from last week. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. And this is one that yeah. we left out. And he had, he, he had some great emails, you know. Right. Um, so a few years ago, I met Shane Robinson kayaking in Spain in the Pyrenees. Um, we talk about loads of kayaking trips, and he was telling us about his next adventure going to Peru for a first D thanks to a competition he won with IR called the Vacation to Hell. I thought it was a deadly idea. I go into the website and saw some of the teams applying for it and some of the actual trips. Um, um, any chance you could talk about that? Maybe bring some of the people that were in those expeditions. I thought it was something super inspiring. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So here's the deal with the Vacation to Hell. The Vacation to Hell was probably the best kayaking contest in the history of kayaking and maybe outdoor sports ever. And it was a brilliant idea. And it was this, that a group of five or six expeditionary paddlers would get together and decide a river that needed to be run or a region needed to be explored. We would keep it a secret. We would then solicit applications from teams of four from anywhere in the world and the people didn't, who, were, who were applying did not know where they were going. They just had to send an application, and they knew it was going to be someplace crappy uh, with hard white water, and you, Dep- you know it wasn't going to be easy. Depending on your perspective, crappy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was going to be awesome is what it was going to be. Yeah. And then uh, and when the, uh, the announcement, uh, when we announced the winner, which was an outdoor retailer, we would also announce where they were going. So they'd win the, they'd win the, the grant or the whatever it was, the prize money, and then they would uh, find out where they're going. And so the first one we did was the uh, Wayaga, the Wayaga in Peru, which is now completely underwater under a dam. It, it really? was attempted. Yeah, it was attempted once uh, by the Vacation Hell crew. It was actually then, ran later, and then ran yep. successfully, top to bottom, by uh, who's his face? Team Beer. <laughs> Nate Klayman, on, Brian Casey. Yeah, yep, yeah, Brian Casey and crew. Uh, 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 who else is there? Ben Luck, I bet. Yeah, that sounds right. And then they dammed it and went underwater. So the idea was... And, is we but would, also Evan and uh, Annie Ole and some other cats went back after Team Bearded and hiked out with like insane high water. Hmm. And that was not that long ago. Well, I was talking to a guy in Peru when we were down there a couple of weeks ago, and he said really? it was underwater. Yeah. They dammed it up. So... No more. It was the it was the last unrun major tributary of the Amazon. It was that river's claim to fame? And 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 Todd and Shane and company they did a great job on that trip. Documented sure it well. Went in yep, there. It was great. Truly yep. explored it. It was yep. it exactly was, what it we went had off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. Then we were going to switch it to a sea kayaking expedition for the following year to try to keep things uh, interesting. And we came up with a really, I thought, a great plan to. A sea kayak. It was going to start from. Geez, where was it, Grace? Help me out here. Um, the northern part of Baffin Island. But then you have to hike over Victoria Island or some piece Devon, of Victoria Island. Devon or Devon Island. Island. Yeah. So On foot. Yeah. So basically, yeah. you went from the northern end of Baffin Island, crossed a sixty-mile-long strait. You had to carry your boat over Devon Island, which is the largest uninhabited island on the planet. This is where the military goes and conducts experiments of what it would be like on Mars. This is where they took the Mars rover that everybody heard about that eventually got lost into space. Polar bear mania, whatever. And then drop over the other side on a shorter crossing to your finish line. That's in Ellesmere, right? In, in Ellesmere. In, in Ellesmere. Yeah. So and Grace, you know this because Grace and I put this on together. 
It was a uh, joint venture. Yeah, exactly. So, continue. Well, it, the sea kayaking one didn't go so well. Long story short. <laughs> so anyway, hey, maybe this is something that's got legs. You know, every dog has his day. You know, who knows? That's right. Well, maybe. and then and then the economy went to the toilet, and kayaking was not great shape, and so we lost all the money for it. However, if there is a company out there <clears throat> who wants to re-engage with the best kayaking event in the history of kayaking. I'd be <laughs> delighted to, to get that started again. We still have the domain names too. So yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's make it happen. One thing I learned from that. Oh, and John, this is when you were trying to make an expansion into sea kayaking and all sorts of things, but I have never put more time and effort and energy into raising funds for an expedition than that Devon Island trip. I mean, just the airfare to get, up to the starting point and back is like twenty thousand dollars. Negotiated all of this stuff, all kinds of things. Totally put my neck out there in such a huge way. I love the idea, and I think uh, the Range Life crushed it on their Wyaga trip. And talk about hate mail when we announced <laughs> that location of that trip. Boy, did we get some hate mail. <laughs> there was a very oh yeah, there was a large contingent of sea kayakers who felt relatively certain that we were sending this group of four guys to be basically hors d'oeuvres or a bunch of polar bears on Devon Island. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then they all pushed out, right? Oh, they went the wrong way. We sent them up there. I spent I spent over. I mean, literally, it was like a forty thousand x dollar expedition I put together for these guys, and they went up there. And instead of going north, they went the other direction. <laughs> they just and they hired boats and stuff. Uh, anyway, and I don't. Dude, I don't. so and I mean, also, I mean, the Range Life guys. I mean, I know they documented it well and gave her hell out there, but like they didn't get it done either. No, well, they no, they didn't. But they, they actually put on tried. and they went downstream. <laughs> that would be one of their noteworthy accomplishments. You know, in that regard. So, <laughs> I mean, this well, is this is a. Yeah, anyone who wants to get involved in the vacation to hell, it's like this is the real deal, man. It's like I have, should... a, I have, I'm sure Grace and Geltman. I'm sure uh, we all have a dozen places. In fact, if we re- if we redo it, it should be the Hammer Factor presents the vacation to hell. <laughs> Dude, we will. You have people calling will... in on sat phone doing doing Hammer Factor updates. <laughs> like, <laughs> like how many beaches like are on so, you right? Uh, Confluence, Yakima. How much Subaru, money do you need? Red Bull. <clears throat> I think we do twenty five thousand dollars. You can be title sponsor. No way. Forty thousand dollars. You can be title sponsor. Forty thousand dollars. This is what it takes. I mean, this is legitimately what it takes to make it happen. Subaru presents the Hammer Factor vacation to hell. All right, let's get that done. I, I like the sound of that. <clears throat> anyway, these, you know, it, it was a lot of economy, and you know, it, you 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 know, for for me as a, as a, as a company that puts this kind of thing on, you don't mind losing money on it to start out because you believe that in the future it will turn into something. Yeah. <clears throat> but the wind, you know, the between the heading south when you were supposed to head north and the economic conditions definitely tamped that one down. All right, can we move on from the vacation yes. to hell? I'm getting bitter here, sitting here right. talking about and this. Moving on from Fernando and his <laughs> questions. But thank you for the thank you for the viewer mail. Let's get this one comes at us from Bernie. Now we had you know our thirty seconds of thirty seconds of viewer mail last issue, and I threw this out to to basically why uh, why Boone was a good college town, and it was instantly poo pooed by Mister Weld. Right to catch people up to speed, uh, Bernie wrote us and suggested that Boone was one of the better college towns for paddling. Yeah, Boone, North and, Carolina, and I. If I remember correctly, I think I compared Boone to Red Lobster, which (laughs) may have been strong language. But I I do hold, I I hold true that I I hold this opinion that if you need to pick three or four of the very best towns to go to school and paddle, I just don't think Boone's on that list. (laughs) Well, Bernie, not a bad place. (laughs) Bernie Engelman. I'm just going to read a few excerpts here. John Weld, who probably has never <laughs> driven south of Fayetteville for any worthwhile rain chasing, <laughs> was quick to classify Boone as a B-list paddling destination. While we may not have the consistency, consistency of the green or the style of the white salmon, we do have world-class rivers and closer proximity to town than any notable run around Asheville. Weld also said that Linville runs twice a year. Linville has ran three times this year alone, and last year I personally got 13 days on the Linville. 
The Wataga also provides some of the best Jedi training for honing skills. And he said, anyway, I'll put this in the email in the uh, show notes. But this is a a great uh, a great response. To, and he makes a very good argument for very, me. I mean, he very should be on argument. the town council. And he says, I think if Well got the chance to paddle Linville Gorge or the Wataga at a thousand CFS, he would form a different opinion about Boone, North Carolina. I have paddled Wataga uh, a number of times. It's a great river, no question about it. And I've never done the Linville because it's hard for me to catch when I live up here, but. I would love to do Linville. Linville is the prettiest place in the East, I think. Yep. That's a great run. But anyway. Super beautiful. Bernie's Bernie's not scared to lay it out. And also, he would like to, he thinks we should invite Team Beer on the show to do a story. I don't know who Team Beer is, but we'll. uh, You don't know who Team Beer is? No. He does. The guys who. We just talked about them. Who just uh, polished off the Wayaga after the Range Life bailed halfway through. That's Team Beer? Oh yeah, dude. Team Beer is stoutest crew of expedition paddlers and kayaking who nobody's ever heard of because that's not what they're about. Okay. Team Beer is is all that is good in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously, man. I'm like I'm a huge Team Beer fan. Nate and Matt Klama, Ben Luck, late Javier Engel, Cooper Landla. <laughs> King Charles, Ryan right. Casey, Matt Wilson on a good day, I'd say. I don't know, it's kind of like a little vague, but I'd say the core is the Klamas and Ben Luck. But man, those guys are like the most savage operators. There you go. Well, thanks for that email, Bernie. And uh, man, I love Boone. You know, Weld hates on it, but I love it. So I think hating on it's a strong word. <laughs> um, moving on to uh, an email here from per- Purvis Major. This is in reference to declining boat sales, a little bit of our. Uh, um, kind of some of the stuff we covered in the last show. The conversation with Joe P. was very interesting. One thing I'm convinced that boat sales aren't so much affected a shrinking paddling community, but more so but the lack of groundbreaking innovation. There are a lot more adequate boats on the used market, and it's easier than ever to get your hand on a used model that is only incrementally behind the design curve. Additionally, modern plastic kayaks can last for decades, especially when lightly used by casual boaters. The inventory of lightly used boats grows annually. I have purchased a new boat last season, Large Loki, but it had been a decade since the last time I re-upped with a new condition boat. I've acquired several used boats over the decade. I'm currently intrigued by the Soul 303, maybe in carbon or glass. Just a thought, Purvis. Hmm. What do you guys think about that? I think there's something to it. I mean, boats, I mean, even Joe said it himself, boats are heavier and stronger nowadays, you, you know, and I mean, I paddled a a Shiva, I mean, for four years, it was as good as new when I sold it, you know, and I paddled a lot in that boat. So there's that. And it's true. I mean, how, how long has the Nomad been around? Forever. Yeah, and it's still a good boat. Yeah, I'd still pick the Nomad to do some hard white water for sure. So, but that's the whole thing. Be able to quantify that. I mean, if you made boats, I mean, who would, that information would be really hard to pin down. Yep. It's really hard to answer that one, but let me ask you this. I mean, things that you sell that wear out, that you have yeah. to repurchase, like a spray skirt or something like that, is there any indication there? Do you see any upswing from years past to now? Is there anything within your realm, your insight? that We have incremental growth, but once again, it's hard to determine if that's just from us taking market share or... It would be, it would be interesting to compare like a run that has like a really solid sign-in system, like, you know, like the number of days on the lower yacht or right. like the Echoey or something like that and compare that with boat sales. Cause I, I think Purvis is my, just my sense is that he's right. Yeah. I, I think so. I think there's something to it for sure. I mean, I mean my, I just, my, my own, my own observation is that, I mean, at least around here, paddling is growing. I've, I haven't seen as many paddlers on any of these rivers as I, as I do now. Yeah. I'll agree with that. I mean, you go to the green on a nice Saturday, you go to the Chio in one of the release days, and there are, I mean, there's hundreds of paddlers there, and six or eight years ago, it wasn't like that. So, you know, for whatever that's worth. Um, what else? Do we do we want to go through a couple of more of these listener emails? Um, we have a great, so Tim Kennedy, I don't, did, did we talk about the Tim Kennedy 
um, his old school boat reviews that he's been doing for us on the last show. Did I bring this up? No, nah, Tim Kennedy is a guy who used to guide out <clears throat> in a high pile, and he had a nickname back then. I'm not going to bring it up because it looks like he's successfully graduated from that nickname, and I'm, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to awaken that zombie. How can you do that? Uh, <laughs> How can you bring that up? And well, not I just tell want Tim to know that I remember. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten. Uh, but he's been amazing in documenting his collection of probably the most obscure whitewater boats of the past 25 years. Yeah, these are uh, really good. These are really good. And doing very well thought out boat reviews. One uh, last week he sent us one about the Saber, which there was a point, there was a crazy point in history where low volume boats were perceived to have all these advantages that high volume boats didn't have. And Risa Shimoda was talking about, uh, you know, this is not I'm not knocking Risa Shimoda, but Risa Shimoda I remember was talking about how squirt boats could be safer in certain circumstances. And I remember like the first descent of the North Fork of the Blackwater was done in Sabres. You know, they run like a gluteal mash, like a 30-foot waterfall. It's about four, four feet deep at the bottom in Sabres. And the idea that you could carve the back end and lift it up for boofing and stuff like that. Uh, and so that, that's where that boat came from. Um, Jesse Whittemore but, design, which you'll probably uh, not I, own I, up I to. But... Was, yeah, and actually he, he, he toured the world with that boat. They, they sent him on a world tour in the Sabre. The thing is these... Tim Kennedy's been sending us these like amazing reviews, but they're they're too long to read. Yeah, like, I, it's like I, it's not going to like be good for us just to read them online. It's like we got to have him come on and just give us like a a little back and forth about his some right. of these words. Well, what I was thinking, like it, it's fascinating. Well, well, what I was thinking is after he gets six or eight or ten of these in, which are like these are really good. You have to go to the show notes and check these out. Like. The, for instance, the one that he sent in this week on the Perception Slasher C1. The Perception right. Slasher C1. Who has There's, a modern review of a Perception? And, and dude, it, that, there, there was 10 of those made. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, if this were any other sport, that boat would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, he talks about his experience with this C1. Which, I mean, he obviously transitions from C-1 to kayaking and taking it on 700 CFS on the Arkansas River. It's truly compelling. There's pictures along with it. Tim, these are awesome. Keep these coming. I'll, I'll go to the show notes and check this out. But If, if you were going to like put me at the top of Pine Creek in a slasher or just like <laughs> like like kick me in the dick as hard as you can, <laughs> I would probably go for it. <laughs> I, I just want to read. I just want to read Tim's last paragraph here in his. But the uh, crazy thing is, there was a time not so. I mean, yeah, at this point, it was a long time ago where that boat kind of made sense. <laughs> like there was enough people sitting around in a room that were like, "Yeah, we could spend fifty thousand dollars making designing a plastic <laughs> racing C <C1."> one." <laughs> right. Well, it's like it's really time to upgrade the Gyro Max. It's got a little dated. <laughs> <laughs> Tim says in his last paragraph on the C1 slasher <laughs> all in all it was a challenging and painful but enjoyable learning experience I'll keep the boat so that I have something to do while my girlfriend paddles her sup on the Colorado <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what you're going to get here in the show notes um, <laughs> uh, Steve Scarborough who met, came up last week in, with the discussion with Joe and his history of dagger uh, has a quick uh uh, addendum or correction to, to uh, some paddling history. He mentioned that Jimmy Snyder was the guy that designed the slasher blade for those paddle geeks out there following along with this conversation, not Backlund. Uh, Snyder came up with it, sent the tracing to Backlund, and he made the paddle. Without a doubt, it was Jimmy Snyder. And I don't, I don't, I don't question that at all. I don't, because Jimmy Snyder, I think, I think unequivocally put an end to the low offset paddle discussion. I mean, he put a nail in that coffin. Yep. yep all right. Yep. yep. Um, this one comes at, um, from Harrison Whitehouse. Um, Harrison says, Hey, love the podcast. I always lamented the fact that people in media suck at talking about whitewater in a meaningful way and writers who approach the sport define it with cliches and platitudes. You guys are earnest and add great insight to the sport that I've been obsessing over for the last 10 years. Thank you. Um, Harrison, very flattering. I was hoping to hear you guys spend some time talking about Daniel De Laverne, his life, legacy, and what he has meant to the whitewater community. 
After watching Buck Fever, I became really interested in his story, but have not been able to find much of anything about him. It seems like you guys are the ones to turn to. I totally understand if you are not comfortable with this, but figured it was worth asking. Also, please bring back Anonymous Boat Review Guy. It made me laugh so hard on the airplane, the guy next to me thought I was nuts. Yeah. Well, Anonymous Boat Review Guy is coming back. We were... <laughs> he's Anonymous Boat Review Guy is currently disposed, but he he's coming back. So rest assured, we have got a lot of love for him. But what do you say about Daniel Delavern? I mean, all I can say about Daniel Delavern is he's one of the most influential people that's ever been in my life. Top five of all the people I've ever met. And I could sit and talk Daniel Delavern's stories forever. But I couldn't do Daniel justice, so it's hard for me to to jump into that. I'll tell you one thing he can do is you can go to Site Z, which is a uh, a really sort of great small core website, long form whitewater story website, uh, SiteZ.com, and there's a story there by Andre Spino Smith talking about the riot days, and talks about Daniel uh, some, but it gives you a little insight into Daniel. Uh, as from Andre's perspective. So that's one thing you can do. I mean, maybe we can revisit the subject. We have time to collect our thoughts on this one because I don't know where to begin with that one. I don't either. Daniel was incredible. That's, that's, about, that's about all I can say about that. Um, we have a few more topics of discussion here until we get into our... Um, bring Pat Keller on to discuss this Instagram post that came up recently about wearing a PFD. So here's what I want to throw out to you guys. Did you guys see the clip that was circulating around? And I know you had to because every one of your family members probably sent you a message about it or talked about it or some of your friends who don't paddle with Dane doing the surfing behind the two ski boats. Have you guys seen this? Casually, like in passing. Like it was on someone's computer as I walked past... It works. You sent it to me. I mean, Teo did this like 15 years ago in some Twitch movie, right? Oh, yeah. Like two jet boats side by side. Creating, play all. creating a big wake. They surf it. Yeah. But but no one sent you an email about it, John, and said, is, is this what you make gear for? Or like people who aren't in the know talk to you about it? Me? Yeah. No. You, Lewis? I don't know anybody who's not in the know, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had people come out of the woodwork <laughs> sending me this thing. I look at the video. It's like got 3 million views. It's the biggest thing to happen in Whitewater since the drainage ditch. I just think it's <laughs> – what, what's the name of the ditch up there that everybody goes down? The, the... the Lion's Day slide. Yeah, it's yeah. like you drive over it on 99 on your way up to see the sky. Yeah, exactly. And so it's amazing the things that catch fire and what people... <laughs> it just goes to show that our sport is stupid and that <laughs> the only way to attract attention is to do something even more stupid. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's well, think... interested in actual kayaking. They're just no, I think, I think most stunts. people think whitewater kayaking is like a carnival stunt or like some Red Bull athlete where they're trying to like ride an elephant out of an airplane with a parachute or something and this is like falls right in with that narrative you, you know what i mean or maybe like, it's like maybe it's like just oh the, here's the kayaking that i know some clown doing yeah, something stupid it's it's like relatable but like different it's like it looks novel but like when you look at that lion's bay slide like you, anyone can look at that and be like i can do that because you can and it's like kind of like the wake boat thing it's like it's like people who are probably morbidly obese and like that's their outdoor sport is like going wakeboarding like they look at that and they're like oh yeah now i get it <laughs> you know it's like that's that's what's relatable like when you look at like site Z, you're like huh <laughs> <laughs> or listen to this podcast for that matter <laughs> yeah god we are so anti-baseball anyway. like, well, we were talking about this just to bring it up again you know when they sent around the the video of Dane and we started talking about the the Lions Bay slide and these other kayaking stunts we were reminded that you know Benny Marr after their viral video of running that Lions Bay ditch was on the internet he got interviewed by like CBC like the like national broadcasting network in Canada and they're like interviewing him and they're like is this dangerous and like tell us about what you're doing and he's just like sitting there with this like smirk on his face and he just first ascended site Z like three weeks before that 
Yeah, it's like all of us are like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Holy shit. And then there's like some somebody on you know, some television panel being like, like, tell us about the concrete ditch. <laughs> and, and in the interview, they never even asked Great. Biddy about the sticky. You know what I mean? It was, wasn't yeah. even on the radar. You know, it was just like, eh. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's the world we live in in a sport where there's 15,000 boats a year sold. Before going to Pat Keller, I have a question for Geltman. Has he given any thought to a new name for the Den Boys Media Cartel? Because let me just tell you about... I mean, this is like becoming something behind the scenes here, Lewis. Why Why do you guys got to keep prompting me to kick Den Boys Media Cartel? Well, I think they asked you to come up with a new name, and I... I, I, really, and I, I, Jay, I think you should be honored by that responsibility. I kindly responded that I have... I know nothing about Den Boys Media Cartel. I'm going to paint the picture for you. You ready? <laughs> it's, it's a bunch of 20-year-olds kayaking, living in some impoverished situation subsisting on probably bong hits and Tide Pods at this point. <laughs> I think you could take that picture and run with it. I imagine like a bunch of like, 15 year olds like, like making GoPro videos in their mom's basement. Right? That's just what I just said in different phrasing. Yes. <laughs> Jake and the I boys just... are not going to be happy about this. I'm just I don't want to be mean. I don't know anything about Dem Media Cartel. I don't really care to know anything about Dem Media Cartel. I, I wish them well in their ventures, but like, I don't care. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you don't think we should I, have a different name? You, they want you to rename them. And I think paddling crews. I think paddling crews are a vital part of the fabric of paddle sports. And I say that only half jokingly. I think they should go kayaking and not be too concerned about their, their no, social. No, you're not getting off like that. The Tide Pod <laughs> Bandits. We need something. <laughs> something needs to come out here. We need yeah, a name. I think that's a name. <laughs> okay. I think that would be good. It's very of the moment. Okay. Tide Pod Bandits. There you have it, Jake and the rest of the media cartel. <laughs> Keep up the good work, boys. I support you. Yeah. I, I just want you guys to know that. Oh, my God. We just lost <laughs> listeners there. Okay. <laughs> Um, are we gonna get? Are we gonna get into Billy Hearn flood story? Well, because this is all you. It is. I, let's go. Let you, uh, let's go to Pat Keller. You know what? Let's get back. It's a great story. You know what? It's a great story. You know what we're gonna do? This is gonna be our first Patreon product project. You can be a patron of the Hammer Factor, and you get an exclusive John Weld story about cops, guns, floods, islands, hiding, all of that. Helicopters, stuff. World helicopters, champions. world champions, beatings. The whole <laughs> for twenty dollars, you and get the John small? Grace. You get the John Weld story, and for twenty-five, you get John Grace's voice on your home answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then mysteriously. <laughs> We'll see none of that money. <laughs> Along with our mid-level boating crew flasks, which, Galvin, have you received your mid-level boating crew flask yet? I forgot that that was what that was. I was looking at the picture that you posted, and I was like, like what the hell is MLBC? <laughs> I mean, what, are we going to throw the MLBC Honestly, probably under the one of the strongest crews out there right now is a mid-level boating crew. <laughs> Jesus. Can we just not offend anyone else before we get into Pat here? I'm being completely serious. I'm going to try to offend you. Where's my, where's my goddamn flask? <laughs> <laughs> hey, as soon as we get Andrew's t-shirts made, which while I'm getting Pat on, can you kind of fill our viewers in on the t-shirts there? Weld. Are they getting yes. made? We have a we have a winner. It was uh, Mr. Andrew Miller, who who oddly enough used to work for us, uh, who now works for Confluence, but he designed the Zinky Subs t-shirt. Um that won the hearts of the hammerheads out there. I, I and yeah. and so he 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 won the dry top. But he does not want the dry top. He uh, he wants to give it away uh, to some I don't know somebody charity something like that. But he's going to come on I think next show and just accept his award and discuss who he's giving this shirt to, he, or jacket to. And he's probably going to take a few minutes to try and <clears throat> take me out of the knees. But I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> I look forward to it. Okay, so let's let's get Pat on here. But real quick, before we do, I want to give a huge shout out to our feature interview sponsor, Canoe and Kayak. CNK has been leading the paddle sports media hustle for 45 years now, reaching a half million paddlers every month. With in-depth articles like the one on Yellowstone, Yellowstone, 
um, love or leave it alone. This is a real good article, and the Hammer Factor is going to give dig deep into this issue of paddling in Yellowstone at some point. More on that later. Um, I'll link to that in the show notes. There is no more compelling way to get your paddle sports beta than CNK. Check them out at canoekayak.com and on Instagram at canoekayakmag. All right, we're getting Pat on uh, on the show today to uh, discuss a Instagram post. That happened, I believe it was on the takeout of the Chioa River um, when this was filmed. And Pat, first, before we get into it and your side of the story, I want to say thanks for bringing an important issue to the surface um, on this. And it was in regards to um, a young man not wearing a PFD on the river. Now, before we start talking about this topic, can you go ahead and give us a play-by-play of what led up to the videos that were posted? Sure thing. Um, it it was it was kind of a sad deal that it that it had to get taken as far as it did, uh, or as it was. But uh, basically, what happened is um, over the last few months. Um, I've seen this young buck, Corey Sheehan, out there with, uh, I'd just say, like a worthless piece of fabric on, in place of a life jacket, where he'd actually taken the foam out of the life jacket and was running it kind of as like a disguise, if you will. Um, I didn't really think that was kosher, so I spoke with him at the time, kind of like, you're kidding, right? And, uh, no, he, oh, no, I'm, I've been doing this. And, uh, I had three separate conversations with him over the last three or four months or so. And, uh, it didn't seem like anything was changing. So, um, when I was at the Chioa, I was walking out, um, at the takeout there. And I noticed that he showed up at another river with that life jacket on or lack thereof. And, uh, you know, my uh, temper got the best of me a little bit. I definitely said some words, but I felt like they were well justified and they were put out there in like with a lot of love because I don't want anybody to get hurt out there. I want everybody to be as capable as they can if it comes down to a rescue situation where, let's face it, it's a dangerous sport. It can happen at any time. So I kind of got into them a little bit um, and, you know, that's that. When, uh, when a few days later, when when we were exchanging emails, it was clear that he was he wasn't really budging on his position. So I uh, escalated it a little bit further. Um, again, I'm not really stoked about some of the comments, some of the name calling, but you know, I guess uh, do do some dumb stuff, ex- <laughs> expect dumb consequences. So, so let me let me provide a little bit more background. Um, Pat, so Corey was kind of unstuffing his life jacket. There was some other people who I want to, I don't want to name any names who were not wearing PFDs and, you know, posting videos and clips about it. And it was kind of becoming like a little thing. You know what I'm saying? Like it was kind of becoming like, it can't be a thing. Yeah. It kind of was becoming a little bit of a trend. Um, so I, I just kind of want to put that out there that, um, while Corey deflated his PFD and all this kind of happened with Corey, there was kind of like a little like kind of behind the scene things thing going on there. So I just want to throw that out yeah, there. Yeah, it seems like there's a little bit of a click right now that seems to somehow to think that's cool. But um, you know, I, I posted that out there and it's gotten gotten overwhelmingly positive response. Um, and it seems like the community was... really rallied together. And uh, thanks for everybody for all the positive comments. It was really, I mean, this was something that went through our office like wildfire. I mean, we were talking about, everyone was talking about this for like 45 minutes. And it wasn't, to be fair, it wasn't all positive. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth on this. I don't think anybody was hard and fast one way, but I think everybody could see a couple sides of this argument, you know? And I think a lot of discussion was like, there are certain safety discussions that you have that are no-brainers. You know, like if you go paddle with a crew of four or five guys and one guy has no shoes and it's winter... You're like, that's dumb, and you're putting everyone at, at needless risk. you know. Or right. if you get to a Class 5 rapid and you decide to run and four people decide to carry it, and people say, well, okay, that's your choice. you know. And those are, those are no-brainers. you know. 
but you yeah. it seemed like what you did entered a gray area and that's why it got so much discussion you, you know like you, know, do you, you can call is it a gray it, area your... if you want but I, yeah. I i stand by my decision um to put it out there because i felt like if three attempts talking to him weren't, weren't going to work um three attempts me talking to him um, I feel like I've been in the industry long enough to where, and I've seen enough happen to where if I tell you something, stroking my ego here, but if I tell you something, there might be a little bit of validity to it. So the fact that he kept doing it, they got fired from Piranha and he kept doing it. I was, uh, one comment said it was a little bit of a hail Mary. And that that's exactly what it was. I was like, look, if I can't change your mind, hopefully the community can. Um, and, uh, the response was awesome. You know, I, mean, I get the the naysayers who are like, man, you shouldn't have uh, brought that to social media. But you now having experienced watching a, a really, really good friend of mine drown in 2003, I would rather get it out there, make it a discussion and have everybody talk to him about it rather than me being the only one at a parking lot um, with the balls to say something and not let it stand. So. I think what ended up happening, it's a bummer to Corey, um, for sure. I knew it was going to blow up. I knew he wasn't going to be stoked with a lot of the comments, but I think he needed to hear it from a lot of people to kind of really pound it in. And uh, fortunately, you guys are hearing it first on Hammer Factor. He sent me an email. He apologized. He said he's going to be running a life jacket from here on out. So, man, Corey, we're good. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everybody who has backed up um, the re- safety requirement that we have in our sport. And, uh, yeah, I wish the, wish, wish the kid uh, the best of luck with his career. I know he's really, really good paddler, and I can see a lot of potential. on him. He's going places. So hopefully that's the last we're going to hear of that and uh, be looking to shred with him for going forward. You know, I reached out to him and said, welcome home. I'm so glad open. let me ask you a question. Sure. You know, I think there's an unwritten law that if you're paddling with your friends or you're paddling and someone is in a life-threatening situation, I think most of us would at least like to entertain the idea that we would put our own lives at risk to help that person, right? If someone's yeah, out sure. there, if, if someone's out there without a life jacket and they get in trouble and it's largely due to the fact that they never wore, they don't have a life jacket, do, does that call that that standard off or do you jump in anyway? Uh, I, I don't care what whether they're li- wearing a life jacket or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to help save whoever is in trouble. Um, right. You know, it's a risky sport, and you may pop up onto something at any time. It might be a pe- your paddle gets yanked out of your hand, and all of a sudden you're upside down. You hit your head on a rock. You're swimming. Maybe you don't have the time to hit your uh, pull your skirt, and you're just bouncing down the river. And anyway, that life jacket is like a seatbelt. It's that last little bit of um, Last little option, last little out before to, to hopefully stop the escalation of events from turning fatal. Because it's not just one little mistake that becomes a bad day. It's one mistake that leads to another, that leads to another, that leads to another. Um, does, that, was, does that answer your question? I, I kind of, I'm not sure if I got it right. Yeah, no, I think it does. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I, I, you know, I watched, I saw all of that and I had, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was probably about Corey's age, obstinately refusing to wear a life jacket. And most of that time was on the Potomac in situations where that was not what I would consider to be a real safety risk. Um, some of it was in situations where it was like really like pretty stupid. And like, I, I don't know, I guess I just like I saw all that. And like, I just kind of like felt where Corey was coming from a lot. Like, I just felt like. I not if he's bringing it to the Chioa and the green, dude. Not if he's being. Um, no, I mean I'm not. Uh, I'm not defending it. I just, I'm just. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 I, I, I don't uh, think it was I, a good decision, but I just like sort of like on a on a personal level, I was like, you know, like I'm not, I'm not mad at him, you know. I'm like, like this is stupid. Like you can't do what you're doing. But well, at the I same still time, don't I like feel sort of desire. justification sure. for doing that. There's, there's no justification. There's no uh, downside to wearing a PFD. The PFDs of today, you've got great range of motion. You can go all the way forward in a tuck to all the way extended in in, uh, in your spine. 
and it's not going to be an impediment. You look at flat water paddlers as far as the freestyle tricks. Hunter Cat is one of the best in the world. He uses one of those huge coca cat life jackets in flat water. So the argument that there's like a impingement isn't really valid, at least in my opinion. Pat, what was so, Corey's response? And what was his initial response? I saw some things going around saying that he kind of felt like was this like a soul boating thing? What was what was the initial kind of public response there? Um, well, when I was talking to him, he was just kind of smiling at me, like, "Yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever." I was like, "Man, what do I need to get get through this kid?" Um, after the post, he was quiet for a little while, and then he responded, um, as Brent point Brent Orton po- pointed out in his video very concisely, that he was very well mannered wasn't coming out to attack me or anybody else. Um, he acted very mature in that sense, but he was still kind of defending his position. And I didn't think that was a defensible position. I still don't. So, what do you think about, uh, like, what do you think about, like, in surfing, for instance, you go to, like, the North Shore of Hawaii or whatever, and you just show up, and there's some locals out there who are like, you're not going out there. You just didn't, you, we don't know you. We know nothing about you. We're not going to rescue you. You know, we don't see you get hurt. You're not going, period. I mean, do you think that's a, you know, it's the same I mean, mindset I where they just don't want to deal with people doing stupid things. You know what I mean? I think, I, I think in whatever sport, you should definitely listen to those around you, especially if they're, uh, they, they've, they're locals to the area. They maybe know some of the um, things going on underwater, whether it be in the surf or in the, in the rapids that um, just showing up there, you might not know. Um, I'm not really like... I'm I'm more of the guy, kind of guy that if I showed up at a at a surf break and mm-hmm. I was just getting into surfing and guys told me, you know, it's too big, I'd mm-hmm. probably not go out. But if I they told me that they don't want me to go out there because it's their spot, mm-hmm. <laughs> then I would be trying to push that limit. But as far as recommendations, I think heed the heed the advice of the ones who've been around. You know. But let me ask Pat, why was Corey? Why did, why was Corey going through the time to unpack his life jacket of the flotation and wear it? Like, why why was he doing that? Did you ever figure that out? Because he's a kid. I honestly don't know. <laughs> I think like the young attitude, thinking that this is rebellious and cool. Maybe somehow thinking that this is cooler than running gorilla at normal level. Um, I don't know. I'm not. I don't care with any of that. Um, I think it just I had mean, to stop. Right Man, I did the, I did the exact same thing so, when I was a kid. Like I had a life jacket that I'd ripped all the foam out of so people wouldn't bother me about not wearing a life jacket. And like yeah, I mean, I just like I I, I don't think I, it's yeah, right and I'm not <laughs> defending it as a behavior. But like I, I know just, and, I and, and and he's a kid and and kids want to try and push, they want to try and make their own path. He want, he's obviously kind of getting really good in the sport, so he wants to kind of make a name for himself, but if he's going to make a name for himself that way, he better be ready for a lot of slack. So what I'm really happy about is that he did get back in touch with me. We haven't put it out there on social media yet. I want, wanted to kind of like announce it here. Um, he didn't really want to go into it and make a big thing out of it. So um, fortunately, yeah. it sounds like he's going to wear his life jacket. That's kind of past us. Hopefully that's not something that anybody ever follows their, his lead because except for the decision to make it right um, because I'll go after after him, and I feel like there's a good chance that now that this has been brought to light and discussed so vigorously online, more people are more likely to stand up and actually say, no, that's not cool. You should put this on. Here, I have a spare life jacket. Or, man, like, you didn't bring it. What are you thinking? Not battling. Not happening. I mean, I think the so. thing, the thing that's the final seller on it is just – the point you were making earlier about like, it's like, you got to be there for everybody else, you know, like. That's right. I can't, I can't tell you guys how many situations where it's like pretty mellow river. I'm just out with my friends and you come around the corner and there's chaos and, you know, (laughs) it's better to be ready than not. (laughs) I, another piece of standard safety equipment that I hate wearing is uh, (laughs) shoes, you know, like I don't like wearing shoes. (laughs) But like yeah, I wear them now, like if I you, and like the, the I would say essential item. I, I remember totally you. I, I remember like, paddling with you, Geltman, on on uh, Drake's one day when you were a kid and you had no shoes and there was snow on the ground. That's exactly why I pointed that out earlier because I was like, 
dude, if you have to hike out, it's a pain in the ass to everybody. Dude, you know, like where, where <laughs> and I'm what, what, going at that point, at that, it's, at it's that point, what do you have to out. offer everybody it's, else? Uh, right. You know, it's, uh, it's right. Really like if you don't have your shoes on, you can't run to the spot. You can't set up a rope. If you have a rope, you're probably going to slip and fall in. That's well, not so ideal. Is, so so like with... to... <laughs> 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 You know, you know, I can, I, 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 I consider. Sh- Shut up, Geltman. And, <laughs> and I, I consider shoes and a rope as the other two essential pieces of gear. So you really need seven: helmet, life jacket, spray skirt, paddle, boat, booties, rope. Well, to me, <laughs> to me, seeing, to me, seeing somebody without a life jacket on the river or whatnot is kind of like when you're like out mountain biking and you see like the dude in his jeans and a t-shirt with no helmet like next to the parking lot like cruising around like it just yeah it just looks silly you know in in, in my capacity but i will say you know i don't want to name any names but i know that for a long period of time there was a contingency of some of our friends pat uh, that who were squirt boating on the Okoe and were trying to get downtime and the rangers would mess with them if they didn't have their life jackets on so um, right. you know, there's and, and squirt boating is a whole different uh, discussion. I do think that you know if you're at a parking park and sink, if you will, a park and play spot with your squirt boat, and your only mission is to go down, but whatever you want to do, lighten up that float flotation or take it off if you really feel like you you have it, don't fuck up. But if if that's your goal, if that's why you're putting on, if that's why you're going down the river on that day. That one's a little bit of a different conversation. Now, what I am not really stoked about is people doing that type of stuff on the golly. At that point, if you're squirt boating down the golly, my attitude is you should wear a lightweight life jacket, but full flotation. If you want to have something that you can throw on and do downtime, even though it's a squirt boat, there's still a little bit of room there. So, I, I watched a guy drown in the golly in a squirt boat like 20 years ago. Dude, and it's Being terrible awesome. to see any sort of stuff like that happen. Yeah. You see it escalate, and it's just the worst feeling in your stomach. Pat, one and of the, it, not to interrupt you, and I fully agree, and w- one of the things that we spoke about and you talked about earlier was – kind of setting this trend, you know, uh, shaping opinions, people like being like, oh, well, Corey's not wearing a life jacket. I'm going to do the not life jacket thing. And that kind of like spread. You're not setting this trend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you know, setting a bad trend, if it will. Right. And, and you know, that's a responsibility that kind of you have as you become a more well-known person in the sport and whatnot. Having said that, you have taken a lot of chances and inspired a lot of young paddlers to do incredibly dangerous things. Do you ever feel like a sense of responsibility or maybe that that is reckless to the people who are idolizing you? Um, I don't think pushing your own limits um, in controlled situations or as controlled as we can make them is reckless at all. I grew up in a river environment. We were going to the river every weekend. I was religiously playing with these little wooden boats um, in the water, building different rapids, seeing how the boats would go through. So I've got a really um, in-depth knowledge of what the river wants to do to a boat. So when I push, I try to make sure I've got safety options set up in any sort of dangerous area. One person brought up in some of the comments, Linville Falls. That is definitely a dangerous rapid. Sure, could stuff go wrong? Sure. But I don't feel like that was really a justifiable comparison because at Lindo Falls, I had, I forget, five or six guys there ready to set safety. Um, at least three different dudes set up in river, river gear with ropes. Um, that was definitely a risk. The second drop <laughs> was a little too tight for comfort. I hit the wall really hard. My paddle exploded out of my hands, but it came back. I was able to get back under control, catch the eddy. Um, go off to the last falls, have a great landing, and that was all good. Any sort of legal repercussions, sadly, came after that. Um, the ranger that was there that day, that day was actually like, oh, I tried to find any sort of way to write you a ticket. They, there was no law against it, so congratulations, have a nice day. Later, when the news, news, uh, newspaper came out with a, 
article basically deeming it illegal, the ball started rolling in that way. I don't really want to get into any of that, but I don't think pushing um, pushing your limits and being uh, a good paddler and trying to see what level you can kind of reach is anywhere near in the same ballpark as just being stupid and not wearing a required safety item. Because at any time, if I were to mess up on the <clears throat> Falls, I had two different guys at the bottom of the first drop that would send me one rope, and if that one didn't work, I had another rope. It's the safety net. Without a life jacket, you're removing your biggest safety net that you have in your back pocket. Well, I've seen you do all kinds of more crazy, dangerous things in Limbo Falls, but do you think that Corey, in a weird way, feels like by not wearing a PFD, he's pushing his own limits? Um, maybe in some way, but as far as my own concerns, he better not. <laughs> well, Beyond that, like if any sort of idea like that is just a recipe for disaster. So if you're listening and you have any sort of inclination like that, don't do it. Just wear a life jacket. And there's so much stuff out there. There's such a big world. There's so many unexplored rivers that there's way better ways to push your limits than to risk not only yourself, but the ones around you who care about you, who are driving home with you at the end of the day that, frankly, would have to drive your truck, your equipment, all that stuff home call your parents have that terrible conversation and we don't want to have any of that we want to keep everybody safe we want everybody to be high-fiving at the bottom of the river um at the bottom of these rapid um we want any sort of rescue scenario to go smoothly as possible have everybody knowing where they need to be ropes at the ready so anything you can do to help save somebody you 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 know you are able to do it and if something happens and you watch something go down you know you did everything you could. Otherwise, you won't be able to sleep at night. So we had this conversation on here probably a few months ago now when uh, Alex Honnold had just gotten some a bunch of attention for maybe it was when he free soloed uh, El Cap. And we yeah. were talking about whether or not there's some comparison between or like what the frontier in that regard was for kayaking. And there was some suggestion that we kicked around for a little while that paddling without a life jacket was the analog to free soloing and climbing. And I think we decided that the comparison wasn't apt. And I think that the, the, uh, to me, the difference is really the, the social aspect of it and having to be there for everybody else. But it would be, be interested to get your thoughts on that. You know, I would completely agree with, what what you ended up thinking where because it's a social sport and you may rely on your buddies at any time that's our responsibility um it's not something where you're pushing the limits it's not something where you're getting more spiritual it's just not worth it especially out now, of the Alex, oh, i will sit <laughs> right because anything could, weird could happen there's a road next to the river people are looking to push their limits and get into the Chioa and they're watching everybody go down. So why represent that? Now, as far as Alex Honnold, he's got amazing skills, amazing climber. He keeps making these insane moves. I keep watching. It makes me so nervous, but the difference there is, (laughs) as you said, Lewis is you fall and it's just you. It sucks for everybody else. Another buddy down, but you're not taking everybody else with you. Like, I think what you're was, what you're saying is like what, the, what, 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 what kayaking is kind of like in in that respect is if you were somebody was free soloing but you had all your buddies attached to that same rope. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what you're saying is that in in whitewater there's a social contract where it's your it's a privilege to take a risk and run a hard rapid and you earn that privilege, um, but it's it's disrespectful to take unnecessary risks to the rest right. of the group and, and to the sport itself and wearing a life jacket. Right. There's absolutely no, that's... there's no upside to wearing, not wearing a life jacket. There's no additional thrill. Precisely. There's no additional challenge. It's just not wearing a life jacket. Precisely. And huge bummer that it escalated so far that it went viral on, on the internet, but hopefully this will kind of dispel any uh, uh, desires to do that further because the community is just not going to allow it. Yeah. Well, we, we've definitely thrown some tough questions at you here, Pat, and I, I appreciate you coming on the show. One thing I want to say in your defense, and I kind of touched on this at the start of the last show, 
is when your friends and people pass away on the river, it has a cumulative effect on you, and it may not even be conscious. And when yeah. I heard you and the language you were using in those videos and whatnot, it may not even been conscious with what's going on, but I sincerely believe in the back of your head you're thinking about the Sam Grastons mm -hmm. and Christian Woods and just things that have happened over the years. So, you know. Matt nah, Sheridan, man. I watched it happen. It's not fun. Yeah. It's not fun. No. So, you know, so, that's that's, that's the know, thing too. Is safe. thank you, Corey, for getting back to me and uh, changing your mind and changing your position on that. I'm really proud of you, dude. Like, we're moving forward. It's all good between you and I. Um, everybody else, just calm down. He's learned his lesson. So, I think you know. On to the next thing. What else you guys got? Yeah. <laughs> you were so safe. Yeah, we're, we're getting ready to get in the United States Olympic Committee here in a little bit. And uh, but anyway, Corey's a rad guy. Pat, we've been friends forever. For sure. Thanks for coming on the show. And uh, you know, there's more to dig into this at some point. I really like the topic of pushing limits and how you focus that and where that goes in paddling. We've talked about it as far as like running big waterfalls or paddling big water or you know, running things in a day or where the next frontier is. And there's all kinds of topics, but taking foam out of your life jacket and going and paddling the Chioa, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I'd, I'd be more than happy to come on another time and uh, expand on pushing the limits a little bit. But uh, thank you guys for having me back on. It's a pleasure to talk with y'all and uh, all is good. So moving on. Thanks, bud. Thanks, awesome. Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for taking the time, guys. But well, there you go. Straight from the horse's mouth. Um, should we get into? Um, we have we have a line item in here of an article. Um, while I am getting Ashley on the call here, can someone fill our listeners in into the article and Ashley's role in? Two, three days ago, there was a really compelling um, piece in the Washington Post by Sally Jenkins, who's a longtime sports columnist for the Post. The title of the piece is, The Olympic Flame Has Been Extinguished, The USOC Should Be Next. And I will read some of this in a sec once we have Ashley Knee on. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, Ashley. Hey, Ashley. This is John, going, Ashley? John Grace. You're awesome. on with uh, Lewis and Weld here on The Hammer Factor. Thank you for coming on. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Ashley Nee, uh, 2016 U.S. Olympian, top of the sport in the U.S. in whitewater slalom for, I don't know, probably more years than you want to admit at this point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, and so, I was just... Uh, so I guess what we were thinking is we, we could just talk about this article for a couple minutes and then catch up with you and more on, uh, on what you got going on these days. Yeah, sounds but, good. Uh, so I was just saying this, uh, this Sally Jenkins piece in the post a couple of days ago, and I kind of want to just read the first few paragraphs of this because it's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty uh, – fiery piece and i think she's pretty spot on with just about everything and then i'm really excited to hear what ashley has to say about it being much closer to this world than any of the rest of us so i'm just going to read the first few paragraphs here every four years athletes scrape the grime and graft off of the olympics and restore them to magnificence we should demand that the Jesse Dickenses, Red Gerards, John Schusters, and Lamoureux sisters become the genuine focus of this country's Olympic movement. Congress should knock down the U.S. Olympic Committee, get rid of the bilkers who skim cash off the sweat of our greatest competitors and give them little or nothing in return. The USOC has its nerve taking any credit for a gold medal in USA women's hockey, given that the team had to threaten to strike just to get decent meal money. The USOC chief executive, Scott Blackman, who I'll add resigned yesterday, made $1 million in salary and bonuses in 2016. Meanwhile, until last spring, our women's hockey squad members were paid just $6,000 in an entire four-year cycle. This is a national team that has medaled in every Olympics since 1998, yet not until they staged a boycott where they granted a raise to a living wage. How is the system excusable? 
The USOC is essentially defrauding us and our champions. Blazer wearing propaganda spouting executives maximize their own earnings while diverting devoting only the barest cash minimums and lifts lip service to the actual care of athletes. If you're wondering how champion U.S. gymnasts could be sexually abused by a team doctor for years, consider that their training center was so shoddy they didn't have a decent medical facility. Their ankles were taped sitting on the floor or in the bleachers. As the post Will Hobson Posts Will Hobson has reported the USOC is supposed to be a nonprofit, yet 129 of its staff make over six figures, and 14 of its executives are paid more than $200,000. Um, she goes on, but the, at the, la- the end of the article is knock it down and burn the remains. <laughs> but I highly recommend this article to anybody who's interested in this subject matter. And this is something that we've talked about a bit here in the past about you know the status of slalom in the U.S. and you know, John Grace has a lot of experience with uh, collegiate wrestling and sees a lot of similar things going on with the NCAA. So, Ashley, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, I would first say that uh, your national governing body requires you to sign a code of conduct which each year, which includes um, a stipulation saying that you have to stay within good standing of your national governing body. So any athlete that has tried to speak out or, you know, speak their mind, uh, is really putting themselves at risk. Um, I'm not actually on the national team this year. I had a year off, um, for various reasons, one being funding, the other being an injury, um, that I couldn't get treated, even though I had health insurance from the U S Olympic committee. Um, so yeah, I feel like I can kind of talk about it. Um, I think that between the gross negligence of what we see happening in USA gymnastics and various other sports, um, I think real reform has to happen. Um, the athlete advisory council has asked for, a congressional investigation into the U.S. Olympic Committee, both the sexual abuse and um, the best practices for nonprofit status, which I would definitely call into question. I wonder, do you ever think that there's something just like inherent in what we describe as amateur athletics, that this is the result? Shoot because off, it yeah. just, you know, it just seems so pervasive. It's like the NCAA where they're making just money hand over fist off the backs of unpaid athletes and you know so many parallels with the olympic sports where like you know the sponsors who show up for you you know every day of the year for four years you're not allowed to have their logos on your on your gear for the one day a year when you actually might be returning some good uh you know providing a real good return on investment for for those people who've been supporting you i mean it just seems like there's so many ways in which these organizations are, are holding down their own athletes do you feel that at all yeah uh i think that the u.s olympic committee has a monopoly on all of this um what you're referring to is rule 40 um which states that you an athlete can't have any logos other than the manufacturer logo uh, on their equipment and it goes into extreme detail i had to cut my logos on my boat (laughs) <laughs> by a millimeter on each side to uh, to even allow that. Um, and as a whitewater solemn athlete, you know, we don't have any U.S. manufacturers of gear or boats or any sort of equipment. So sponsorship is non-existent, if I'm going to be totally honest. Like, I have one sponsor that uh, since the games, which has been really nice, but basically I get paid in soap. <laughs> uh, can you can you eat the soap or is that <laughs> nah <laughs> you can't you can't eat the soap um, so at least i smell okay you know you. <laughs> it doesn't come in pod form <laughs> <laughs> so ashley what happens if you just show up with your sponsor stuff on there they just won't let you compete in the olympics you have to give up your spot what's the you'll be disqualified and and your uh credential will be revoked yeah, so my headphones and sunglasses had tape over the logos. Um, yeah, oh, that is so pathetic. So, um, you know, it's crazy to me. I'm reading through, reading through this article that Lewis referenced. The what the athletes are looking for isn't out of the ordinary. I mean, 
they're looking for 50% of the revenue for the USOC to be split amongst all of the athletes. I mean, it doesn't. Well, that was Sally. That was Sally Jenkins' idea or proposal, but it seems pretty. I mean, reasonable. So to totally level with you guys, like as a woman in U.S. slalom kayaking, um, the only woman to represent the U.S. in Rio, um, a woman hasn't been supported financially in my sport for 15 years since Rebecca Giddens, and she won a silver medal in 2004. It was epic. Um, and two to three men have been funded that entire time. So there are people getting support. It's minimal, like not enough to pay rent, but it's trying to reimburse the athletes for the fees that we experience. I mean, this year is going to be flying to Europe twice, flying to Rio once, and then the training and racing involved to try to compete with the Europeans. Um, when I crossed the finish line in Rio in my semifinal run, the first thought that crossed my mind is, how do I pay for Tokyo? <laughs> so what's the difference between... I mean, there's the USOC, which is the United States Olympic so Committee. So I couldn't race. <laughs> there's the USOC, which is the United States Olympic Committee. Then there's the USCKT, which is the governing body for kayaking in, in the United States. What's the relationship between those two organizations? Are they the same or? So it was USA Canoe Kayak, so USA CK. Mm-hmm. And right before Rio, um, the U.S. Olympic Committee said that we were not within the proper uh, protocols that they require, mostly having to do with the Ted Stevens Act. And they basically said that our program was bankrupt and we wouldn't be able to send an Olympic team. Um, Adam Van Grack stepped up and became the president of the program and basically put a pause on all of that until after the Games. Since then, there's been a merger with the American Canoe Association. Um, Apparently, that's supposed to be a really good thing. It's almost like the ACA is a really good organization that has a huge membership base, Um, But for me personally, all I've seen is my coach getting let go and then my health insurance getting let go. Um, And so I virtually actually have no support whatsoever. So if you make the U.S. team, you sign an athlete agreement of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. And who's that with? Who's giving you the athlete agreement? That's at this point. uh, I don't know if it's I would assume it's not written by USA Canoe Kayak, but it's written by the U.S. OC, the U.S. Olympic Committee. And so they have, and so what they have is the U.S. Olympic Committee has a basket of sponsors. Mm-hmm. And theoretically, when you sign the athlete agreement, you become sponsored by those same people. Is that, that's the, that's the arrangement? No. So you sign the athlete code of conduct to be able to race. Okay. And represent USA Canoe Kayak. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that it has anything to do with sponsors. So all. you're you're up to your own to get you're up you're on your own then to get your own sponsorships beyond beyond Correct. that because but, Gelman, correct me if I'm wrong but I remember like when Kara was racing she would sign an athlete agreement and she would get a, a basket of sponsors from the USCKT you know and she could not go outside of those and then like remember Shipley didn't sign the athlete agreement because he felt like he'd get more money through I guess Adidas was his sponsor but that was not part of the team agreement does that sound familiar Ashley or anybody so. The current uh, athlete agreement doesn't. Maybe now there's just no money, so there's limit uh... you from having your own sponsors. They, I don't think they can do that. But what they can do is limit the advertisement opportunities for that. They can, I got you. So they you, can... so basically, you're on your, you're on your own to get sponsorship. You you have to figure this out on your own. Absolutely. That's the long and short of it. So who is sponsoring the guys? Um, I mean, it's individual based, you know, right. but the funding, the actual money that is month to month comes from the U.S. Olympic Committee. Who made the decision to give money to the boys on the on the Olympic team, but not the girls on the Olympic team? I have not been able to get an answer, um, but what they've said is there's a performance criteria. 
Now, because I wasn't on the team last year, I stepped up and tried to ask those questions. Um, and I was informed that there's a selection criteria, but it's not written. And there's no actual performance standard that you have to meet. So I asked more questions and they wrote one. Um, and now there, it was in a confidential phone call, but there's now a performance standard written that is two places above what any American woman has done since Rebecca. So basically, Grace, it's like you being the best woman in the U.S. isn't enough or being the best man in the U.S. isn't enough. It's like how close are you to the top of the field in international races? So it's like if you're you know, in the top 10 or the top 20 or whatever it is in World Cups in your class, you get funding. If you're not in the top 10 or the top 20 or whatever it might be in like an international field, you don't get funding. But is until that- this summer that there was no number so it was somebody's opinion wow but i mean it seems it seems like the broken thing about the system is 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 that kind of the rich get richer i mean there's no development in process you know what i mean <laughs> yep. unless you have a rich uncle or rich parents or something you know to be able to train and travel full time you're probably not going to be able to enter that loop you, you know what i mean absolutely and then when you get to that level and you want to continue I don't know the solution for that, to be honest. So far, everybody everybody has GoFundMes. Um, but, you know, I know that even the guys that are funded have taken on second jobs. And so being a not-funded athlete, what does that mean? Three jobs? And also with a travel schedule of traveling four or five months out of the year, you're not very employable. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I guess I guess the, the really the, the, you know, the bitterest pill of this all is you look at not only the the USOC organization making tons of money, but NBC makes billions of dollars off of the Olympics. Yep. None of it's, which makes it make, makes it. And the then money the, the Olympic host cities get you know stuck holding the bag for like billions of dollars of debt for like ridiculous infrastructure, right? It's like the whole thing is kind of a a pyramid scheme, or I don't know what you want to call it, but it's it's not a financially defensible model, it seems to me. You know. So what's the answer? We need to figure this out here on this show, actually. <laughs> if we could just spend the next 15 or minutes hashing out some ideas, I think we can come up with some, some solid ones. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with, for the immediate, is working with the ACA to try to uh, come up with a good structure that supports as many athletes as possible and actually work on a development program, which is getting zero dollars of funding. Um, uh so that's like manageable at the same time the athlete advisory council is asking for congressional investigation into the u.s olympic committee i mean this guy larry larry probst how do you say his last name ashley i don't know probst i don't know (laughs) p-r-o-b-s-t i don't know this is just from the article yeah is has there ever been any talk or has it ever been discussed what justified his one million dollar salary like, what does he do to make that $1 million? That was that was Scott Blackman. I think Probst was the board chair, and Scott Blackman was the, was the Black- CEO or whatever who just got fired or resigned yesterday. Okay, so He resigned for medical reasons. <laughs> just so we all are very clear, we're very clear on how he resigned. Um, no, it's due to uh, prostate cancer, but, I mean, he needs to be investigated just as much as everybody else. I don't know. It just seems to me like there's a good model with like the NBA and other professional sports where, yeah, of course, they're, they're, the people who are running the show have got to get paid and they need to like have an incentive to do a good job to make the league strong. But like, how, you know, there needs to be some sort of, I mean, I don't know where the money, the overall money for the USOC comes from. I don't understand the business model, but I just cannot wrap my head around the fact that Number one, there's no like set amount of money that the athletes get, or not even individual athletes, that the athletes get paid out of the total budget. And number two, how can they how can they just ambiguously give money to certain athletes and not to others based on like I guess like you're saying, like popularity? It's man. Well, I, even I, then, I mean, look at the look at the girls' hockey team. I mean yeah. <laughs> I mean they're they're the best if not the best in the world, certainly top three. And they're making six thousand dollars every four years. 
I mean, women's even, soccer team. It's the what, same. What, what not even white wear kayaking gear is that crappy of a business. Did, <laughs> did we need to? Yeah. Did we can start an Olympic committee? Did we can start one and we just give right. a little bit more. Money. Ashley, I got three hundred bucks for you. If you got if you got yeah. seven thousand dollars, you could buy you could buy a hockey player exactly. evidently. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, this is ridiculous. I, I mean, no it's idea. interesting. Like to be honest, like my best results have came from the seasons that I was better funded. So the the better my GoFundMe or my community support happens, it, it has equated to better results, period. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and it comes down to being able to eat the right calories. <laughs> They're expensive. I mean, <laughs> besides soap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that when I get home. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't count it out, out of hand. Wow. <laughs> this has been the Tide Pod episode. <laughs> Man, this is great. Yeah. I had no idea how nuts this was. I mean, I knew it was nuts, but I just had no idea to the level. That's well, I mean, there's there's uh, there's an old there's an old trope in in paddle sports industry that the Olympics killed slalom in the U.S. You, you know, that was the beginning of the end. That before slal before the Olympics, slalom was actually a pretty pretty robust community, and you know, you'd have. 30 or 40 women alone apply, you know, showing over the team trials every year, you know, but it's a, a, a fraction of that now. I mean, Ashley, what do you think about that? that yeah, notion? I've definitely seen it dwindle uh, in my career alone. And, uh, you know, it, it was really quite sad, this last Olympic trials, the way that they set um, the Olympic selection criteria, basically the athletes, maybe the top two, three athletes were fighting for a spot, but you sort of knew that it was theirs and you had no shot, which to me doesn't really entice anybody to come and race. And, and it's just been, I don't know, getting a little bit worse and worse. And, and I hate the reputation of that slalom has. Like, I mean, I think it's definitely as valuable as it always was um, in terms of paddling skill and training. Um, I mean, would it, would, an more answer, more <laughs> would an answer be for 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 Whitewater to get out of the Olympics to just say we're not interested anymore and to have a governing body that raised sponsorship within the United States? And, you know, I mean, I think I think a well-run organization in the United States that wasn't tied to the Olympics can and offer you know prospective companies a, a bunch of benefits they can't get to the Olympics. Exactly, pretty attractive package. Exactly, well, I mean, like I mean, think if you're a sponsor, just you want to be screw a, it. I mean. Yeah, think if I you're. I mean, it's every four years. It is it's ruining my life. Well, you know, it's ruining now, my sport. Well, hang on, just a second, real quick. I mean, like, think if you're a huge Ashley fan and you want to give her like thirty thousand dollars. Well, you, that's that's great for Ashley, and whatever. But if you want to be a part of the Olympics, I mean, I don't know what the buy-in for the Olympics is, so it makes no sense. It's just basically cutting. You know, am I am I making sense there? I mean, it's just. Yeah. Dude, we got to start. So, we got to start our points. own organization here. <laughs> One is that this is not the case everywhere in the world. You know, like when I go to World Cups and World Championships, I'm racing against people that are fully funded. They have jobs in the military. They're, you know, different countries have supported their athletes in very, very different ways. I know that the UK, um, when an athlete retires, they're still funded for six to eight months afterwards because that transition is extremely difficult. Um, and you hear more and more athletes in the States speaking up about mental health issues after, after the games. Like, um, I don't think, I think it would be a shame to have Whitewater get out of the Olympics. I think that there's a lot to be said for people that want to have that drive um, and reach that level. I just think that there should be a really intense reform um, and uh, like putting our priorities back in development and making it okay that like I was told it's by the US Olympic Committee we pay for medals period like we will only support you if we believe that you will win a medal so yeah I mean that's just is like pretty I don't know there's some backwardsness to it right now it's just like that just seems like such a model that's driven by earning a payday for the people who are in the top of the sports bureaucracy, right? It's like medals are probably what drive TV viewing and what allows them to bring in sponsors. 
and for them to increase their own salaries, but it's not like a holistic look at developing a culture of sport in the United States. I mean, but you see like parallels you're saying, like and... investing in development, investing in keeping the sport vibrant and popular. It's like, that's just not on their radar. Yeah. At least like the NCAA does that for basketball. You know, I mean, they totally shaft yeah. all the players as well, but at least they make it a point to blow up the sports, to blow up the programs, to tell the Cinderella stories and all that kind of stuff. USOC doesn't do anything like that. Those guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's a little tricky. And I mean, I think if you talk to different athletes, you'll get a little bit of a different perspective. But I mean, the only direct support I've gotten from the U.S. Olympic Committee was uh, $2,500 for my trip to Rio. Uh, and then I even had to pay taxes on it. Um, so <laughs> it's been been definitely a challenge but i don't know achieving that goal definitely made sense to me especially in the moment um and i and i certainly hope that kids grow up and still want to strive for that but have a chance a real chance to do it (laughs) well ashley we're running out of time here but this is super good conversation but before we go you know, the Olympics come and go, but the green race happens every year. How do we get you down here um, for the race and, uh, and get you on the starting line? Where this is going. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, that's I'll cover key. your travel expenses and, oh, yeah. and your entry fee to come on down. So. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of training up for the Great Falls race. I've started running more and more big whitewater, and to be honest, Leaning on the Whitewater community has been a godsend for me, especially this last year. Um, so yeah, I'm stoked. Nice. <laughs> I'm what are you up to? Are you, <laughs> are you are you uh, are you coaching cheap training for Kaleva? I believe they're uh, a yeah. show sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I work for Kaleva, uh, teaching kids and adults, and uh, I just talked them into starting a solemn program even amongst all this, um, and trying to, trying to do it the right way, you know, and have, have the love of the sport stay, stay fresh, at least, I mean, historically in the DC area, like we've always harbored it a little bit. So try to, try to keep it going. Right. So Ashley, we're starting a, actually we, Kara is going to be starting a slalom community up here with IR with part of her Devo team. And the game is on for the Pen Cup race. We're going to kick your ass this, this, oh my gosh. this fall. So. Oh my, gosh. my name's you already better, on that trophy, baby. You better bring the heat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get some more kids up there. Absolutely. That's I want to see like, I want to see like 75 kids show up at the Riversport Slalom this, this August. That's my goal. But to be honest, like I think three out of, uh, a lot of the Olympic team in the last few years have started at the Pen Cups. There you go. Right. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Ashley. Have you ever listened to the Hammer Factor before? I have. Okay, so you know <laughs> about our... I apologize for anything I've said earlier. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for well, too. Um, <laughs> but we end each show, and we're way over time schedule on this show, uh, with a little rants and rave segment. So we're going to include you in on the rants and rave segment. Um, but before we get into it, I got to give it a shout out to our Rants and Rave sponsor, Kaleva's Liquid Adventures. They may have the largest commercial kayak program in the U.S. Now, they put this in the ad copy. We got to talk about this, guys. Maybe the world. Each spring, we take over 90 paddlers out on an eight-week training program to get them ready for the Cheat River Race. The first Saturday in May, our program includes attaining up the Mather Gorge and the Potomac, downriver sprints, and technique drills. So dust off your long boats and meet us at the river. Go to Kaleva, C-A-L-L-E-V-A dot org to find more information about treat cheat training and also our Oregon semi-stout trip, which I know nothing about, but largest kayak program in the world? What do you think about that, Ashley? We just added one more program on uh, high demand. It's crazy. We're up to 99 boaters, I think, starting next week. Um, I'm missing the first two weeks because I'm headed out to the Grand Canyon on Saturday. Um, but it's it's an experience. It's massive. It's good, good fun, good community. Um, and, you know, we, we get people to progress, but there's different levels for everybody. So... It's awesome. I just, Gelman, what were you saying about this? Talking about this earlier before we got on the air. 
Oh, I was just surprised that Kaleva was touting largest commercial kayak school when it should be touting like the most hardcore commercial kayak school. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's like I like, I, I might just rave about about this cheat training because I like this is like the best value in paddle sports. Start us off. And, Start it off. This you're, is your rave. You're uh, it's like you get to like go out after work, go attaining, like really like work on like the basics that like everybody needs to work on. Like your forward stroke technique and like just putting power on the boat to be able to do attainments. And like you're getting coached by people like Ashley Nee and like Andrew McEwen and like I mean you're learning from I mean it's all like like the most humble badasses. So like, you're not going to be like, Oh yeah. Like this, this somebody with like, like 20,000 Instagram followers, but it's somebody who knows kayaking like better than anybody, you know, and like, just, and like, you might be sitting out there thinking like, ah, you know, like the cheat's pretty easy. Like I don't need to get coached up to like race the cheat. It's like, it's not about that. It's about like, crushing the cheat. Like you're just going to so much. It's about crushing. It's not even about the cheat. It's about just like getting better at kayaking. And, like, that's just kind of, like, yep. having a little goal to work for, I think. I don't know. I mean, you're deeper than I am, Ashley, but I just, like, if you're in D.C. and you have the time to do this and you're not doing it, no matter how good you are at kayaking, I think you're missing an opportunity. Exactly. It doesn't matter where you're starting, you know? It's just trying. <laughs> trying to get better. And you could actually touch McEwen. That should be your slogan. <laughs> <laughs> touch McEwen. Uh, 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 <laughs> okay, well, do you have any rants or raves that you would like to talk about? Man, I have a rave, and it's kind of a, a, a personal rave, but I'm going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm bringing the show down. Uh, so IR, man, IR is a small business, and, and if you do a, make a start a small business in the United States, at least, you it didn't used to – I don't think it used to be this way where you could – I think there was an idea like 30, 40 years ago, even when we started, you could go to a bank – and write a loan, and based on the merit of your loan and some some assets, you could probably cobble together a good relationship with the bank. But nowadays, you need you basically to, to borrow money. You need to have the liquid assets represented almost to the exact amount that you're borrowing, and it's really hard. I mean, if you're starting out a small business now in the U.S., you, it's much harder than it was when we started. You know, and even when we started, it was tough. But the point being is that you need like 10 seriously 10 really lucky breaks to make a go of it in, in any business and that's on top of having a great idea and a great work ethic and we we had great you know super lucky breaks number two through ten for us was this guy named chase sheridan who is going through some tough times right now but <clears throat> without this guy there would be no ir you know, and if you guys love IR, you should recognize this guy because he's just been a tremendous, tremendous help for us over the years. So, there you go. My rave is Chase. I love you, buddy. There you go, Ashley. Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you wanna, that's a tough act to follow. I'm sorry. You yeah. could be like, I love soap. Something like that would be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that the divide between slalom and, and whitewater is, is my rant. <laughs> um, I've been definitely trying to bridge that gap. Um, and I don't know. I'd like to see more whitewater paddlers paddling slalom and more slalom paddlers paddling whitewater. And and especially now, like, knowing the situation, um, I don't know. It would be super cool to see 2018 be real big. There you go. It's a good Take one. It. Well, I'm going to. That's, ra- a, that, 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 that's such an important subject, the relationship between whitewater and slalom. I think that's something that we need to keep alive. That idea. Yeah, it's it's such yeah. I mean, I feel like it's something we keep revisiting, sort of tangentially, over and over again. But like, I'll, I'll say it again, man. You get the best whitewater paddlers at the feeder canal and watch them stumble trying to do a five gate course and hit poles and miss gates, and they'll be like, "What the what the fuck." And that's when <laughs> my you trick realize, is to make them flip. <laughs> yeah, that's when you realize what the, the depth of stuff they do not know about about water. You know about reading water. It's interesting to it, for Ashley for me to hear you say slalom, and slalom paddlers need to be whitewater paddlers, and whitewater paddlers need to be slalom paddlers. It's crazy how much of a divide there is because to me it's all whitewater paddling. But it didn't yeah, it's just that there's way. there's so much for whitewater paddlers to learn from slalom racing, and slalom racing is an ongoing sport and 
activity like cannot succeed without rebridging that divide and that connection with what we're battling. I don't think like exactly. we need each other. Yep. I need you guys. <laughs> <laughs> But that's how I grew up, too, you know? Like, at Valley Mill, you had to paddle everything. Valley Mill! <laughs> Grace, Grace loves it when we talk about Valley Mill. Yeah! Uh, Throwing it back. <clears throat> well, uh, he was like, Grace was like wrestling around other, with other dudes and like, he's, we were at Valley Mill living the life, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping with prickles in the paint. I'm going to <laughs> rave about the neighborhood that I live in. Oh and all of the people, we recently just built a whole bunch of dirt jumps and berms and a whole pump track. And Nick Haas and Adam Winton and Steve Fisher and all kinds of people went out there and built this badass course and track. That's all I got. Way off topic. My rants and raves are always off topic. <laughs> I'm just. Pretty sweet. All right. Well, I think that concludes our episode here. Thank you so much, Ashley. And where can our listeners find out more about you? Uh, I got a Facebook uh, athlete page, Instagram, uh, a website I never update. (laughs) But mainly just follow Slalom, you know, like ideally the ACA is going to be posting stuff and come out to the races. Find me on the water. That's how you do it. (laughs) Very good. All right. Well, thank you for listening to The Hammer Factor, and we will catch you later. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, seriously. Thank you. That was great.